Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here at my next Avatar Top 10 video. This one is going to be basically a top 10 things that I still want to know about the Avatar Universe uh, video. To, to explain this one a little bit better, because it's kind of hard to just like put into one or two words like what exactly this video is, it's kind of like the idea that if my, Mike and Brian kind of came up to me and said, okay, hey, we're going to tell you 10 stories, things, anything basically about the Avatar universe, past, present, future, what are they? What are the 10 things that you kind of want to know? So this is going to be a list of little things about continuity, stories I still want to be told, unexplained things from the two series that we have already, and so on, little facts that I want to know. So that's what this list is going to be. I'm also going to say that this list isn't really one where there's like too much of an order to it. I'd say apart from my number one, I don't, the other others aren't really placed in any sort of particular order. These are literally just 10 things that I do want to know at some point. So uh, this one's definitely less about what's my favorite and more just, oh, here are 10 things that I do actually still want to know. So uh, yeah, let's get into this, starting off with uh, my number 10 thing that I still want to know about the Avatar universe. Number 10, fairly obvious, but um, just I want to know more about the Avatar The Last Airbender and also the future Korra, you know, family trees of these characters. Um, with Avatar, obviously, the, the main ones we need to know are did Sokka have any kids? Did he and Suki get married and stuff like that? And that's the sort of stuff we want to know there, but, you know, we still need any confirmation on who Zuko married and stuff like that. Um, like, we, we know that now... Uh, General Iroh 2 has a sister, so like stuff like knowing her name, and then even just stuff like about the core characters, like I'd, I would like to know like in the future, like did Mako ever have kids with someone, did like Bolin and Opal like get married, did they have kids and stuff like that, did, did, just what are the confirmed relationships and stuff like that in the universe and stuff like that, that's what I really want to know. In addition, this is kind of going to be also the, I suppose, the one on my list where this covers the whole who is Su Yin's father, that's something we still don't know, and Michael Bryan seemed very careful about not telling us that, because they specifically said that Kanto was the name of uh, Lin's father, but they didn't mention Su's father. So uh, there's some weirdness about like what they do and don't reveal. Like, um, honestly, I, I would kind of question at this point, like how much of the family trees do Mike and Bryan actually know with the Avatar characters? Um, they seem to have them mostly mapped out with, you know, like Tenzin's family and that whole thing, but um, still, it'd be really interesting to just get the full family tree and know all of these characters' um, names and so on. Like, like say, Tonrock and Unalak's father, is he in any way related to, like, Chief Arnook or... Is he related to one of Chief Arnook's brothers or something like that? Like, how does the, like northern water tribe like uh, family lineage work and um, I'd love to get more deeper into the Fire Nation royal family tree and even the Earth Kingdom royal family tree and stuff like that. There's some interesting things to kind of definitely come out if they revealed a full kind of uh, family tree system or something like that so that's my number 10 pick let's move on to number nine. Number nine thing I want to know is some more information about Amon. Uh, specifically two things here. This is, first of all, how Amon and Hiroshi met and came to kind of form the Equalist together. And then also, I suppose, involved in that would just be how Amon came to have the, get the mask. Where did the idea for that come from? Slash that whole story about uh, Bender ruined his face and stuff like that. And then where do, when in his... Um, life did he learn about the technique to kind of take people's bending away using blood bending those are kind of like three kind of things that are probably all related somewhat into the story of Amon Noatak after the events of Skeletons in the Closet like when he runs off leaving his brother and father behind where does he go where does the mask come from where, when did, where did he learn the power and how did he meet Hiroshi I think they're all interesting things to learn about him on that would absolutely complete his character arc so that's my number nine pick onwards to number eight 
Eight is a simple one, it's just the one kind of unexplained thing about Unalak, and that is, when did he first meet Vatu? Like, with the portals kind of closed and stuff like that, how did he come to meet Vatu and, in general, um, kind of know about Vatu, I suppose? Um, there's a there's the implication in the universe that Vatu is known about, just like Rava kind of was known about before we knew, but specifically obviously he's a spiritual person and even in like the flashbacks to where he kind of basically hired the barbarians to attack the Northern Water Tribe, how did, at this point did he know about Vatu? Was he working for him at this point? Um, or was it just the thing he'd never actually met Vatu until we saw it in book two, but he was kind of, you know, working for him to try and help free him because the Red Lotus are kind of of the idea that, okay, yeah, it was always the plan to at some point free Vatu, Chaos, and stuff like that, because he's the spirit of Chaos, but had he met Vatu before? It's an interesting one, because I don't think it's like a full-on thing, like, this was a story we weren't told the first time he met Vatu, but it's something that we just don't know, like, when do they meet for the first time, but um, still, th that's something I definitely would ask them, what, what was the situation with that? So let's move on to number seven next. Seven again is kind of an obvious one, but um, where's Sokka's space sword right now? Is there a plan in the future, or has the sword already been found or something like that? I really want to know where the sword goes from here. It seems like such an important weapon that it it, it doesn't make sense for it to just be like lost as of the end of Avatar The Last Airbender. It makes sense that at some point it is found again. Like, I think a lot of people have been kind of like breaking down some of the images we have of older Sokka, um, and they seem to kind of show him either with a new sword or with the same one, maybe he found it at some point. So I would like to know where exactly the sword goes from here. Like, I can definitely see it at some point in maybe one of the comics, them giving Sokka a big moment where he finds the sword again, but um, definitely it's, if, if if it came up, it's definitely a question I would ask, just because it hasn't come up as of now in the comics, and where we are right now, Sokka doesn't have the Space Sword, and hasn't mentioned it in a while, so um, maybe they're hinting towards it being coming up in the comics, but I would like to know specifically where it is right now, and I assume there's somewhat of an interesting story behind it, because it's a very noticeable sword being, you know, black made of a meteorite, someone randomly finding this would make a big deal about it and so how, however Sokka maybe potentially gets it back or someone else finds it in the future would be super interesting in my opinion. But let's move on to number six. Number six is just a question of like is there the potential for the past avatars, the memories of them, the knowledge of them to return at some point? We lost him at the end of book two, and you know, Korra is basically the start of a new Avatar cycle. But is there some way for him to come back? It just seems like at some point it would make sense for her to restore that. Just because it seems weird to just forget about them now. Like it, it made sense within the story of Korra that she, in the later seasons, had to kind of deal with a lot of the stuff on her own. But now that she is kind of fully kind of uh, realized and fully developed as a character, it wouldn't be so much of a kind of restriction or kind of an unnecessary help for her. It would make sense that she would maybe want to at some point find a way to restore them. Personally, like based on information we have right now, it would kind of make sense that somewhere in the spirit world or using the Tree of Time or something like that, that she could potentially restore the past avatars because obviously the Tree of Time works as sort of a kind of uh, memory bank of like all memories so Rava with the Tree of Time that would potentially work but we're not really sure because obviously this is the kind of restored new Rava rather than the old one so um, I'd like to know just just see what Mike and Brian's maybe like opinions are on doing anything with the past avatars like it just seems so weird that like Aang, Kyoshi, Roku, you know, Yang Chen just gone as of the end of book two I can see them maybe returning at some point. Maybe it's not Korra who restores them. Maybe it's another avatar. But it, it's something I think it's important enough to the universe that it, it would happen at some point. So I'd like to hear Mike and Brian's like 
just their take on it is there a way or you know what but um, yeah let's move on to number five five is one of the more obvious ones on my list and that's just um i would definitely have them explain to me the iroh's past like we know a lot of little events in iroh's life uh, before the start of the series we know about the the siege of bossing say we know he went to the water tribe at some point we know he went into the spirit world we know he visited the uh, ancient sun warriors a lot of these little events but none of them massively connected or like linked together so much so i definitely want to know just the this was the narrative of what specifically happened obviously the the death of lu ten at the siege of bossing say probably kicks all of this off of course but where does he go from there like he clearly like abandons his post he doesn't want to be the next fire lord and stuff like that but how does the spirit world thing come about what actually happens in the spirit world when he goes there and um, how does that change his life and his perspective on things because he clearly becomes more about the four nations after this point and um, and then of course now we know from Korra that he actually went into the spirit world and was basically a spirit now and um, so that's another thing like his life after the end of Avatar The Last Airbender we know a little bit about it right now but towards the end of his actual life as a human how does the decision to basically go into the spirit world come about and stuff like that so there's a lot of just things about Iroh where I just like would like them to explain the story and how it all kind of comes together what is the kind of character arc of kind of Iroh's past I suppose but uh, let's move on to number four Uh, number four is a bit of a continuity kind of question and that is just um, we obviously know that the Avatar 1 episodes are set 10,000 years before the Korra episode where she gets told this story. So, you know, you have 10,000 years and then Roku and a few other times we had mentioned that um, in terms of the number of Avatars that exist there are about a thousand Specifically, Roku said, I've mastered the elements a thousand times, uh, like thousands of times in a thousand lifetimes, or something like that. So, at the very least, there is 1,000 avatars as far as Roku is aware, unless he's exaggerating. So, doing a little bit of math, 10,000 divided by a, uh, a thousand means you have the average age of every avatar, you know, average age of an avatar is 10, which doesn't make a lot of sense given the magnitude of importance of this type of a character. And the fact that, you know, the youngest avatar that we know of the, who died was Roku, uh, was not Roku, um, was Kurok at around 33 or something like that, I think it was, when he was when he died. So he's the youngest avatar right now that we know who, di who died young. And then the other ones, like, lived pretty long. Like, Roku was, like, 70, I think, when he died. Aang, obviously, um, you know, <laughs> a little bit older than that. Um and you know Kyoshi died at 230 so like there's a really big skew of ages here so something is either wrong with regards to how many years the one episodes are set before or the number of avatars that actually exist so I, I, I definitely asked the question of them because it seems like such a basic kind of numbers thing to get wrong in the universe um, but at the same time there could be some sort of an explanation where there was a run a run of avatars where they didn't live very long and that explains the kind of low average age of the avatars or maybe roku was over exaggerating things and there is only uh, maybe a couple of hundred avatars and so the average age does go up to closer to like 40 or 50 which would make more sense um or or else the the years is meant to be more like closer to a hundred thousand rather than ten thousand but that doesn't make that may not make much sense it, it it it's a weird one it's it's a continuity error i don't see a lot of people mention but to me it's like a really big one it's the most glaring probably continuity error in the entire show for me in terms of just they specifically mention these two numbers and they don't work together but uh, let's move on to number three This is kind of a big one, and that is, um, I, I would definitely want to know just the the backstory of the members of the Red Lotus. 
we didn't really get to know them that well as characters um, in book three. But I think just in terms of their powers and stuff like that, they all have potential for really interesting stories. Pali reveals a little bit about her backstory that I think would make for a really interesting story if we knew the full details of it. Just with regards to the whole, she was kind of forced to work for this uh, work for this warlord and Zaheer saved her and that started their relationship. But even like Pali's early life, I think it would be interesting to get you know, what kind of what clan she comes from, what her family comes from, where the whole combustion bending thing comes from. What, what's so unique about the tattoo? Is she somewhat related to Combustion Man? Or what? You know, why is she so tall? Like, that, that's a big thing about, uh, of the two Combustion Benders that we know. They're both extremely tall people and they both have the tattoo on their kind of, uh, kind of uh, third eye kind of chakra point thing. So um, it, it'd be really interesting to just know a little bit more about her history, where she comes from, which would explain a bit about Combustion Bending and its origins. Um, and I suppose more the details behind it, like why the tattoo is uh, necessary, and why the people are so tall, um, and and then yeah, the more personal side of it, you know, uh, how she came to meet Zaheer through the whole warlord thing, and then how she joined the Red Lotus. Like th th there's there's some interesting stuff there, with uh, Gazan, um, again lava bender, unique uh, history right there. How he learned that he was a lava bender. What what are his origins in terms of where that ability specifically? comes from he also has a like tattoos over his body that um are kind of linked into some other characters who we've seen have similar uh, tattoos so he, he comes from a, a place that clearly has some sort of unique culture and um, i'd really like to know about that um and just how he came to meet the group um and, and be so obsessed with the red lotus as well that there's stories with all of these characters um even ming Hua, you have a really interesting story there, and that she was born without arms, yet she was a waterbender. So, like, which tribe does she come from, north or south? Um, uh, how did she adapt to using waterbending to basically create arms for herself? Um, and as well, how did she meet the group? That, 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 it, it, there's just a lot of questions about how did this group form together, and it's a lot of the reason why you don't fully connect with them as characters, because you don't know how they met. Like, Yes, they're all part of this organization, the Red Lotus, but we don't even know a lot about that, let alone, let alone what the characters' personalities are. So there's even just interesting stuff with them, with their bending techniques. And then Zaheer, like, a lot of people say, oh, he's the one developed character of the group, but even him, like, we know he's like this warrior poet who has an interest in airbender culture, but none of that is ever, like, stated in the show specifically. You just assume that he has an interest in poetry because he keeps reading it. Um... And yeah, he's a super good martial artist beforehand, and that's why he adapts to airbending so quickly when he gets it. But where did the interest in airbender culture kind of come from? How did he come to join the Red Lotus and form this team, despite being um, a non-bender basically at the time? Um, and in addition to that, I think you could also get a lot of uh, cool story stuff around showing us or telling us the full story of the first kind of the, the attempt to kidnap uh, Korra and how that fight actually played out. The four then but Zaheer without airbending against like uh, who was a Tonrock, Sokka, um, Zuko and so on. Like th that's a, and Tenzin, that, that's a super interesting fight to, if we ever got a chance to see that. So I'd love him to just explain to me a lot about the Red Lotus. Uh, maybe go into some detail about Jaibao. Um, uh, how the grove got its name in the spirit world and just uh, m more details about why he left the order of Red lotus specifically and what that meant going forward but uh, yeah that's my number three pick uh, onwards to number two this one i think is super interesting and definitely the top two are the absolute big two questions i would ask mike and brian if i got the chance um i would like them to explain to me um some of the details of the war that basically ha happened around the time of Wan's death. So obviously Wan dies during this big war between humans um, that he couldn't stop and that basically he couldn't f bring balance and peace to the world because this war was going on. And uh, we don't know the result of this war. Uh, we barely even know what started it other than the fact that humans um, had this constant need for you know war at this time. So 
for me, the way I see it is that this war is basically between all of the various groups uh, that split off from the Line Turtles. Um, influenced by one, obviously, starting the kind of uh, move away from living on the Line Turtles. So, for me, this war is the war that basically, the result, basically defines the way the world map looks right now. So, the idea is that the Earth Kingdom won that war. So, that's why they basically, their kingdom is the biggest, and they basically have the full big land mass in the middle of the entire map. The Fire Nation and the Water Tribes were the other... Um, uh, two people that were involved in the war and so the Fire Nation lost and retreated to their kind of island off to the side. Water Tribes uh, lost and retreated to the north and southern Water Tribe with some of them sticking around to create the... No, that that that, that doesn't link in well. I was going to say Foggy Swamp Tribe but they have a different origin that stems from the north and wa southern Water Tribe. But yeah, the Water Tribe had formed because they lost and then the Air Nomads clearly didn't take part in the battle and just kind of stayed on the outside of things. So that's why they have a temple in the north, south, east, west. So to me, that's what the war, the result of the war and what, what actually happened. But I would like to know the full details. Like what was Juan trying to do in this war? What was, what was the war about in the first place? Like these random people who lived on line turtles, clearly a lot of humans at the point, this point in time didn't even know that there were other line turtles or other groups of humans. So... Why did the conflicts really come about, given that the spirits uh, were back in the spirit world? It's just one of the really interesting things that just is brought up, but like not really addressed or given that much time at all. So, uh, and then I, in addition to that, just how did the war actually come to an end? Because it was clearly still going at the time that Juan died. So, the next Avatar that they helped to end the war, or was it the third or fourth Avatar? How, how long did this war actually go on for? I think is really interesting and unique and there's a there's probably a really kind of a more mature style of story there with like real focus on what war means and stuff like that so i think that that's really that's a big thing what that war was about but let's move on to my number one thing that i want to know about the avatar universe so the 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 first question i would ask mike and brian if they gave me the opportunity to ask something like this and give me an answer would be just um, explain to me the origins of the line turtles like I think the question really has moved from like before Korra what's the origin of the avatar to being what's the deal with the line turtles like th there's a lot of things that the beginnings episodes already brought up with them about just like why did they care so much to protect hu humanity basically why were they protecting humans from the spirits the spirits seem pretty reverent towards the line turtles like i think calling them like ancient ones or something like that and in the beginnings episodes rava calls them um, the line turtles that so they're clearly really important beings in the avatar universe but we don't know where they come from like because they they leave they specifically make a point of saying that they leave they're not going to protect humans anymore and we never really see them again Yet, the uh, the next time we do see them is when Aang needs help and one comes to see him. And then we also have the library has an image of, I think, one of the previous avatars meeting a lion turtle as well. So they've clearly made sporadic appearances throughout the world's history since they, the humans stopped actually living on the lion turtles. But they, just there's an interesting thing about, like, are they related to the spirit world somewhat? Or... Are they kind of beings that are kind of beyond both? That they're more powerful than spirits and humans and they maybe come from some other dimension or what? I think the implication is probably that the Lion Turtles are the first physical beings in the Avatar universe in terms of like, say, Rava and Vatu and like the water, uh, the moon and ocean spirit and stuff like that are some of the first spirits. Whereas the Lion Turtles are probably the first physical beings, and that's why there's a level of respect between, say, Rava and the Lion Turtles. Um, and that's why they protect humans, because they're both beings born from the physical world rather than the spirit world. Um, I, I think that's the kind of implication I'm getting here. And because of that, they have uh, kind of more physical powers, uh, being able to grant people bending and um, spirit bending, uh, you know, energy bending and stuff like that, uh, these powers. So that that's interesting whereas like you know there are there's clearly power levels of spirits in the spirit world and then there's 
obviously parallels between various animals and physical beings of the Avatar universe. So I, I, I think just that the line trails are fascinating in, in general because they can speak kind of telepathically, I think, to people is the implication. I, I don't know, it was kind of a weird one, like are they actually speaking or is it telepathic? I, I think it is more of a kind of like they're speaking into your mind. And then that they're obviously their power, specifically their power is energy bending. Yet they also have some level of control over their elements as well, because the airline turtles could fly, float, um, and stuff like that. But they they made a point of specifically only lending power to the humans. So just I suppose that the, what I want, like the explanation for, is just what's their goal, and it kind of links into kind of something I was talking about earlier on. It's just like what's the idea of the spirits? Like what what do the spirits do? What did the line turtles do? Why did they specifically leave the second humans kind of found some sort of independence for themselves? And why did they specifically return to help Aang in a time of need? And when is the next time we're going to see the line turtles? Because we didn't see them in present day Korra. And there was no real hint of them even showing up at any point. So I think there's so much potential with the line turtles going forward that they are the biggest kind of question that I have about the entire Avatar universe. That's why that's my number one choice here. Because I just I just want to know about them because they're not animals and that they, they can communicate with people. They're intelligent. They have powers beyond most animals. Like obviously the there's like dragons, badger moles, um, and sky bison who have like specific powers of their own. Like the sheer shoe has its own techniques. Humans are obviously the big, the big intelligent kind of uh, beings in the kind of world. But the lion turtles, at a base level, are the kind of origin of all bending. And, you know, energy bending and stuff like that. So, there's some fascinating things to come from them, I think. And there's the idea of, like, maybe some of the lion turtles were hunted at some point in time. But where are they hiding right now? Like, where is the lion turtle that helped Aang right now? So... That's my number one pick, and that is basically the end of this video. That's my top 10 things that I want to know about the Avatar universe if I was given the chance to be told 10 things by Mike and Brian. In a comment, I really want to know what some of your choices were. Like, where if you could ask Mike and Brian to explain to you one thing about the Avatar universe that we don't know yet, what would it be? But um, yeah, that's basically the video. Next, going to reveal what the next Avatar Top 10 video is. So the next video uh, in the series is going to be basically, it's going to be my Top 10 Underappreciated Episodes of Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra. So it's going to be a mix, and it's just going to be me talking about the episodes that I feel the fandom doesn't quite give enough credit to. So it's, it's interesting, it's going to allow me to talk about maybe some of the lower ranked episodes and some episodes that I personally like that a lot of people don't. So that's going to be next Wednesday's video, but uh, for now, thanks for watching this video, and bye.